This is the fourth lecture of the course on EU-Russian relations and uh, we are covering EU's institutions today. Previously we discussed Russian ideas, Russian foreign policy ideas, Russian foreign policy institutions and the EU's ideas. So today is the fourth lecture of this blog covering the EU's institutions. And firstly, let me remind you that the European Union is a particular entity and we frequently speak about three pillars. I know that the Lisbon Treaty is reputed to have eradicated the pillars, but in fact the difference uh, in the decision making is preserved and therefore we in fact uh, say that the Lisbon Treaty converted the European Union from a Greek temple, where pillars are outside, to a Roman temple, which seems to be a single entity, but when you enter in, you still see the pillars. Yeah? And the pillars are uh, are formed because of the difference in decision making. So, uh, the European Union is a temple where member states and citizens are in the foundation and therefore the European Union is a union of uh, member states and citizens. And then there are three pillars, an economic pillar, a foreign policy pillar and a pillar which covers cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs. And finally there is a roof, yeah? every temple has a roof. And the roof is made of institutions which are the same, but at the same time because competences of the European Union and member states are different, uh, their interrelation is different uh, in every pillar. And when we speak about foreign policy, when we speak about EU-Russian relations, we are mostly interested in the first and the second pillars in the pillar that covers economic relations and in the pillar that covers foreign policy relations. But of course, because we will be covering justice and home affairs, visa issues, migration, cross-border cooperation, we will be talking about the third pillar as well. Okay, continuing the talk about the specificity of the European Union, we have to remember that the European Union has a dual nature. On the one hand, it's an international organization, and um, it is based on um, international treaties which are signed and ratified by every member state of the European Union. And then on the other hand, the European Union is a political system and therefore it has many features which equate it to a political system. Now, for example, it has a common market. For example, the European Union has a common currency which is in use in 19 out of 28 member states. For example, the European Union has a common judicial system, a common system of decision making which uh, has legal consequences, direct legal consequences for citizens. The European Union has a flag, the European Union has foreign policy, it has cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs. So in sum, uh, there are many attributes of a political system within the European Union. So the European Union is somewhere in between. Yeah? It combines attributes of an international organization and attributes of a political system like a state. Yeah? And it is this particular combination uh, which uh, makes uh, it very difficult to deal with the European Union. When we talk about the European Union, we also talk about a particular division of uh, power uh, among three levels. Uh, among the European Union, member states and regions. Yeah? And it is of course relevant for external relations because external relations can be formed at the level of the European Union but also at the level of member states and at the level of um, regions of member states if you speak about cross-border cooperation. Yeah? So functional division and therefore any external partner of the European Union, including Russia, always have to keep in mind, always has to keep in mind which issue uh, we are talking about and at what level uh, they have to talk to the European Union. And of course, within the European Union we also have a functional division of power in the sense that um, we don't have a classical division into legislative, executive and judicial powers. Uh, judicial branches, we have uh, a particular division of power when different functions within the executive, legislative and judicial branches are fulfilled by the same institutions. Yeah? So that of course makes dealing with the European Union even more complicated. 
are key players within the European Union. No? Uh, there are uh, several uh, key players uh, and this slide in fact combines intergovernmental players within the European Union. Firstly, we'll speak about the European Council. You know, the European Council brings together heads of states and governments of EU member states and that depends on uh, the political system of every member state. And of course the President of the European Commission. Yeah, so these or all these people get together at least two times every six months to discuss um, various issues of importance within the European integration and in particular international relations. They make political decisions. Well, they're not necessarily legally binding, but that's somehow a guidance uh, for other institutions. And of course, uh, there is one person whom we always know about from the European Council, and that's Donald Tusk, who is the permanent president of the European Council. The European Council has permanent presidency since the Lisbon Treaty came into force. But on a par uh, with Mr. Tusk, uh, we have pre presidency of member states, yeah? and presidency of member states is important because uh, there are various borders within the European Union that have to be chaired, in particular the Council. Yeah? And then of course Mr. Tusk is not present everywhere throughout the world, whereas member states normally are present throughout the world through their embassies. Yeah? So on the ground, it is also up to a country which has presidency to somehow uh, exercise leadership among member states. Uh, there is also a border which is called TRIO, which uh, brings together three consequent presidencies. You know? And this is um, a fixed uh, combination for a period of a year and a half, 18 months. Yeah? And within these 18 months, uh, the leadership changes three times, you know, every six months. And TRIO basically um, always uh, adopts some sort of a program yeah, and provides leadership for the rest of the European Union. And I already mentioned the Council. You know, the Council brings together member states of the European Union. And the leadership in the Council is exercised by the country presidency. However, that does not affect the composition of the Council. Uh, which deals with external affairs. Yeah? So when ministers of foreign affairs get together, uh, the presidency is exercised not by the country presidency, but by the high representative, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, at present. Yeah? The council decides on the basis of the commission proposals, um, uh, when it, um, it is uh, about uh, competences of European communities, when it is about economic issues, and then uh, member states or high representative can also suggest uh, initiatives if they fall into the foreign policy domain. We are particularly interested in the Foreign Affairs Council, yeah, in the composition of ministers of foreign affairs, but also in the General Affairs Council. General Affairs Council also includes ministers of foreign affairs, but the task of the General Affairs Council is our overall coordination of various issues rather than foreign policy. Uh, of course, ministers busy, they get together only from time to time, and therefore there is a particular body that prepares their deliberations, and this is the CORAPER. CORAPER is a French abbreviation from the Committee of Permanent Representatives. Committee of Permanent Representatives consists of, of ambassadors of EU member states to the European Union. These are people who are based in Brussels, yeah, who uh, meet regularly two or three times a week and who basically prepare all deliberations of the Council, of various councils, including um, the Council of, um, in the composition of Ministers of Foreign Affairs. There's also a political and security committee which, is, uh, which consists of uh, national officials based in Brussels who are of less senior level yeah, than the Corporate. They get together also very frequently and they uh, discuss various issues of political and security uh, cooperation. Uh, there are working groups on different issues. And then, of course, there is High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy, uh, and this is Mrs. Mogherini at present. So she has 
double hats, yeah, or triple hats, in fact, yeah, because she is the face of the EU's foreign policy, she is a commissioner for external affairs, and she is also president for um, the Council in the Composition of Ministers of Foreign Affairs when they meet as Foreign Affairs Council. Yeah? So three, three different hats, which of course makes her extremely busy. Key players are uh, on the community side, yeah? on the communitarian side. Of course, first and foremost, that's the European Commission. Yeah? And at present we have 28 commissioners and there are several commissioners who are important for us when we speak about external relations. These are uh, commissioner for external, for external relations, whom I already mentioned, yeah, Mrs. Mogherini, who also has other hats. Uh, commissioner for trade is extremely important because this is the key power of the European Union. Commissioner for enlargement and the European neighborhood policy, commissioner for development, Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response, and in the case of Russia, of course, Commissioner for Energy. And the European Union has multiple embassies uh, throughout the world. We don't call them embassies, we call them delegations. Uh, the European Commission uh, has various tasks. Uh, first and foremost, it's the guardian of the treaties. Yeah? It is responsible for the fact that the EU's legislation is respected. It is the motto of the integration. Yeah, it drives forward integration processes. It has administrative tasks. It manages external economic relations um, and manages the budget. Uh, so quite a lot of tasks on the part of the European Commission, in particular dealing with um, external relations. Uh, other community players include the European Parliament. The European Parliament is, of course, important in terms of the representation of uh, peoples of Europe, of citizens of the European Union, but at the same time, its role in external relations is fairly limited. The European Parliament decides on the Commission proposals. It cannot initiate its own proposals, but it can always ask the European Commission for a proposal. It can also prepare drafts, reports of its own initiatives. Uh, the European Parliament supports contacts with other parliaments throughout the world, including with the State Duma. In principle and practice, relations are frozen at the moment. Uh, the European Parliament holds annual debates on external relations, and um, it also tries to affect other fields yeah, of external cooperation, not only through its reports, which is a power of the opinion, but also through the budgetary means, by basically saying what it will approve and what it will not approve in terms of the costs and expenditures of the, um, of the of EU bodies. And then finally, the European Court of Justice, uh, it controls the compliance with the EU's law, including when it comes to external relations. It also has the right to decide whether a proposed agreement is in accordance with the EU's acquis, so it's a preliminary control, which every institution can ask for. But other than that, uh, the European Court of Justice is limited in external relations uh, because uh, it cannot control the compliance of member states with what um, has been agreed. There is one more function of the European Court of Justice which is important for us, for the Russians, yeah, for anybody who is under the sanctions, because the European Court of Justice is the body to which any, um, any physical person or any company can appeal if they are included in the blacklist, if they are sanctioned for whatever reason. Uh, this is a brief... Uh, scheme which summarizes the interrelation among various institutions. So the European Council in general provides for a political impulse to all institutions, yeah? in particular to the European Commission and the Council. Then the European Commission can suggest some initiatives, the, European, the Council and the European Parliament decide among themselves what to do and what not to do. There are two bodies that can be consulted in principle. European um, Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of Rituals. And then there are three bodies that exercise different sorts of control 
the European Court of Justice in terms of the legal control, the Court of Auditors in terms of expenditures, Ombudsman, uh, respect for human rights, and all of that's about fight against fraud. This is an overall and general scheme, and of course the role of Economic and Social Committee, Committee of Regions, and the European Parliament uh, is limited when it comes to foreign policy per se. Here's another scheme uh, which deals more with foreign policy, and we see High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so she proposes different issues to the European Council and then implements the decisions of the European Council. Uh, she is in close contact with the Foreign Affairs Council. Yeah, she presides in meetings, and then she um, asks for the approval of different initiatives. Uh, she, uh, the High Representative, of course, is a member of the European Commission. Yeah as a commissioner for external relations and she takes um, full part when it comes to decision making within the commission. She presents her findings, her reports, her deliberations to the European Parliament at regular meetings and then of course there is political and security committee which brings together member states of the European Union and provides opinions to the high representative there are uh, various uh, smaller groups like the European Correspondents. Yeah? These are people located in various institutions who regularly exchange what's going on in different domains. Uh, there is an EU military um, uh, committee which provides uh, advice on various military operations. There is a uh, there's also, there are also various working groups uh, that I mentioned and there are diplomatic representations of the European Union and its member states which uh, regularly consult the European External Action Service. The European External Action Service was set up as a result of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, it consists of uh, former members of the European Commission, former members of the Secretariat General of the Council and some national uh, diplomats. Yeah? So very diverse combination, but that's sort of a compromise. It also allows for drawing on different sorts of expertise uh, which exists within the European Union. In terms of the, uh, the procedures for decision making, there are two different types of decision making procedures depending on what area we talk about. Yeah, remember the pillars? This is exactly the issue of the pillars. So historically, competences of the European Union are linked to economics, yeah? trade, assi economic assistance, uh, development policy, enlargement. So this is all about traditional competences of the European Union. And therefore we talk here about uh, the power of the initiative of, of the European Commission about some sort of control of the European Court of Justice and about qualified majority voting in many fields when it comes to member states. If you speak about foreign policy, foreign policy started uh, its formation within the European Union in the 1970s in the form of the European political cooperation. It was informal, it was in due respect uh, of the competences of EU member states, uh, of the sovereignty of EU member states, and therefore we mostly have unanimity here. We uh, have a limited power of the European Commission, of the European Parliament, and of the European Court of Justice. So member states have to agree on various policies, and they have to, you know, make, uh, to reach some sort of a consensus when they decide on foreign policy. So just a bit more about economic links, uh, when we speak about economic links, we speak about common commercial policy, we speak about economic cooperation, association, enlargement, development, that's policy for former colonies, and of course economic assistance. Yeah? So various policies, yeah? with the enlargement probably being the strongest policy of the European Union in the sense that it makes partners of the European Union completely change what they do. Yeah. But that's of, of course, this is of course an instrument which is limited in its geographical scope and in its scope and principle. When 
when it comes to foreign policy instruments, we speak about general principles, decisions on actions, positions, and arrangements to implement these decisions, as well as strengthening systemic cooperation among member states. And all of these instruments are prescribed in Article 25 of the European Union Treaty, and most of these uh, documents require unanimity. The European Union has tried for a number of years to move from unanimity to qualified majority vote, and some achievements were made. Now, for example, if you implement a decision that has already been achieved, you can use you, know, you can use qualified majority voting, but still these are exceptions rather than rules. The European Union also has political dialogues with virtually every country in the world. The European Union can implement sanctions, and that's a curious combination of a political decision on the one hand about the very fact of implementing measures and um, economic decision in terms of the um, substance, in terms of how we implement it. The European Union does some crisis management, mostly civilian crisis management, less so military crisis management, and the European Union has some possibilities of uh, collective defence, but that's uh, that emerged only in the Lisbon Treaty and it's still fairly limited. The European Union is a member in the various international organizations. Uh, the membership can be different. In some cases, the European Union is just an observer on top of member states. In some cases, there is a mixed membership and both the European Union and member states are members of an international organization. And that happens when uh, an international organization touches upon the competences of both the European Union and member states. And then in some cases the European Union is not present, but member states have to coordinate their positions because of their membership obligations. The European Union had both successes and failures in dealing with international organizations. Kyoto Protocol or the WTO are frequently provided as examples of successes, whereas uh, OECD, for example, and uh, cooperation and discussions on investments within the OECD or food and agricultural organization. These are given as examples of failures of the European Union. Talking about the military power of the European Union, we have to say that the military power is virtually non-existent. Although there are some structures, and I mentioned some of them already, uh, which exist or which are frequently discussed, like a military committee, uh, which uh, is involved uh, whenever there is some sort of a peacekeeping operation, a military staff, which is a part of the EU's external affairs um, service. Uh, the European Union has a satellite center, an, an institute for security studies. Uh, it uh, has um, uh, discussed for a number of years rapid reaction forces and battle groups. Some parts you know, of these um, entities were created, but uh, they're not still fully fledged, not to the level that the European Union planned. And talking about peacekeeping operations, uh, here is a small map yeah, of both civilian and uh, military peacekeeping operations. We see that the European Union is mostly engaged in civilian peacekeeping operations, less so in military peacekeeping operations, and the majority of those operations are either in the proximity to the European Union or in former colonies. In the case of former colonies, the process is, of course, driven by EU member states uh, and by uh, the colonial legacies of the member states. Uh, summarizing our discussion about economic relations and political relations, we just have to stress uh, that uh, there is a community pillar, yeah, which involves economic relations and also civilian uh, peacekeeping operations. And then there are political relations, including security and defense and military crisis management. We speak about same institutions here, but they have varying competences. Uh, and frequently, because the line between politics and economics is very thin and very dodgy, there will be some battle for not like ground yeah, for competences. And uh, I also have to admit that the EU's resources are mostly economic 
and they are frequently used not only for economic policies but also for the sake of uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, finally, uh, we have to uh, raise the issue of singularity of the EU's foreign policy. Now, because of this pillar's legacy, because the decision making in politics and economics is different, uh, uh, the result is a discussion about how coherent the European Union is. And uh, while well, there is a difference uh, between the European Union on the one hand and member states on the other hand. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Lisbon Treaty was adopted, because the Lisbon Treaty had some remedies for that in terms of the single legal personality, and Mrs. Mogherini is currently both the uh, face of the European Union foreign policy and the Commissioner for External Relations. Uh, there is uh, always, there is also a single legal personality for the European Union, so the European Union can actually now be a subject, like in any treaty. Yeah. Previously, treaties were signed uh, by, the European, by the European communities when it came to economics and member states when it came to politics. Yeah. So one person for common foreign security policy, single legal personality. There is always uh, a there is now a loyalty clause which was introduced by the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, the procedure for enhanced cooperation in the field of foreign policy is easier and therefore member states who really don't agree with some sort of an initiative can always opt out. In terms of the implementation, however, of the Lisbon Treaty, there are some uh, criticism. Firstly, uh, both uh, Catherine Ashton and Herman Van Rompuy, who initially uh, took the positions of the High Representative and the President of the European Council, and the current couple, Donald Tusk and uh, Federico Mogherini. So both uh, sets of officials are frequently criticized for being fairly weak personalities and therefore not ambitious enough in exploiting the potential of the Lisbon Treaty. Member states are still not too willing to surrender all the competences to the European Union and they frequently insist on the specificity of their views to be respected. The single legal personality of the European Union, the fact that the European Union can sign treaties on its behalf, uh, does not remedy the fact that there are still different competences in different fields. And therefore, procedures in the field of economics are easier, procedures in the field of foreign policy are more difficult. There is no clear line between economics and politics, and that complicates the issue as well, both for the European Union and for an external partner like Russia. There are some new contradictions between the President of the Commission, President of the European Council and the High Representative yeah, in terms of who does what, who is responsible for what, who is more important in which domain. And of course there is always an issue of the Commission preserving its collegiality and it's not quite clear whether the Commission can preserve its collegiality when Mrs. Mogherini is not only a member of the College of the Commission but also is a High Representative. So this is a brief summary of uh, how EU institutions work and how decision-making in the European Council in the field of foreign policy takes place. And with this, I will wrap up our lecture on EU's institutions and welcome you to our next lectures.